Welcome to TFF. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to TFF. News from Cardiff, Wales. Breaking news. Hello, good morning, good afternoon, wherever you are. Um, welcome to the Footy Forum. And as you can see, for the first time on TFF, we are not alone. It is not just me and this lovely specimen, Jovan. We've got a new individual joining us. And his name is Tyrese Fauna. To help introduce yourself, why don't we just do a quick fire, just some icebreaker questions. I've got some right in front of me. So why don't we just fire yeah, those out and then they'll get to know you a bit. Awesome. Okay, so as you time. said, how old are you? You just said 21. it, but there you go. How tall are you? Six foot three. Who do you play for? Well, I'm on loan now, so I'm at playing for Argyle, but my parent club is not in the forest, so. Not in the forest, yeah. good stuff. And who do you support? Arsenal, easy one for me. The okay, your band's gonna, your band's gonna like you. Really. Okay, <laughs> true. And if you weren't a footballer, what would you be doing right now? Well, not on a Sunday, uh, but, you know, Monday to Probably Friday. be a football agent, actually. Football agent, Looking after okay. clients, yeah. Something that's okay. always, okay. like, intrigued me. So, yeah. Staying in the football world. True, true. Yeah. Okay. And who do you think, now we're, you know, about five or six games into the season, who do you think are going to be mm -hmm. champions this year? For me, um, Liverpool. Don't, don't say Arsenal. I was going to, okay. No, Liverpool. not Arsenal. That's good. Liverpool, yeah. Okay, fair. Even without Van Dyke. Yeah, I think their their team just all over the pitch just oozes quality. Even the players okay. are not playing. I think awesome. Like they can walk into any club, basically. Yeah, it's true. Yeah. Also, check out episode four where we broke down. You know how Liverpool are going to deal without Van Dyke. Little uh, yeah, little teaser there. That's going to be so, interesting. Yeah. It is going to be very interesting. So definitely watch episode four. Mm. Um, your favorite food, Tyrese? Yeah, tough one. Probably spaghetti carbonara, actually. Yeah, my Always guy, that is my favorite. Also, with like yeah. some chicken or veal escalope on top, you can't beat it. Yeah, yeah you can't okay. go wrong with that. Yeah, you, you take a chicken or veal milanese, but you take the tomato sauce out, you add a carbonara. Perfect. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so <laughs> that's, I'm liking that. I'm that. liking you. I'm liking this. Okay, and then Not your that. current favorite song, uh, probably Truth Be Told by Tootsie. Can't go wrong. Yeah. Dream holiday. Uh, Dubai. Dubai. Gorgeous yeah, weather. Love Dubai. Lovely place. Yeah. We're gonna switch over a bit before we start chatting about um, you know, a bit more about you and your experience. Um, mm -hmm. we're gonna introduce something we've come up with called the No Name Football Game. Mm -hmm. Bing! Um, <laughs> and yeah, so to quite simply explain how it works, um. So it's kind of me going against Tyrese. You'll see some graphics on your screen, which will break it down. Tyrese is trying to advance the ball up the pitch um, and I'm trying to stop him or vice versa, whoever has the ball. Um, and then any time where um, we've kind of guessed the same direction and we have a coming together um, in terms of avoiding or getting an interception, Tyrese will have to answer a question or when he's having a shot on goal, he'll have to answer a trivia question in order to try and succeed in that scenario. Um, You'll get a hang of it as it goes along. Um, so we're going to introduce that now. Um, I'm going to go against Tyrese. Jovan's going to be the, the referee slash commentator, whatever you want to call it. The gamekeeper. And, the uh, gamekeeper. We talked about it. The Canadians and the Americans or whoever else um, that, like me, are having a headache because of this accent. Uh, <laughs> usually I can take it because it's just Morgan. But now I'm gonna, I usually joke around with the English accent, but I'm going to just do Canadian accent for this next few minutes just to <laughs> allow everyone to rehab and, uh, and transition back to sanity because it's shocking. So obviously the rules, we, we, Morgan touched on it. We start with the goalkeeper. Always three options, whether they can go wide to the left, wide uh, or central or right. Um, and every time the ball moves, we're going to go through a question for turnovers or shots on goal. So, Tyrese, um, I don't know what the situation is, but I'm going to let you have about two and a half seconds to pick a team. If you want to pick Plymouth, go ahead. It makes sense. But if you want to pick the Gunners or something else, 
You got two and a half seconds starting now. Uh, Arsenal. Arsenal. Okay, Morgan, Arsenal. Leeds. Sounds I've good. The, I've got the, the kit on me, yeah. All right, so goal from the keeper. Bert Leno with the ball. Um, you can, now you have three options. Uh, mm -hmm. We're going to go there. So you can either go down the left flank, central or right. So the ball played for Bert Leno, looking to go up central through the pitch, but he's blocked off and a press as Leeds press high. And there is a chance now for Leeds to win the ball in a dangerous area on the pitch. So we will have a first question of the day. Uh, obviously, if you answer correctly, you're okay. You win the ball mm -hmm. back. Uh, however, if you get it wrong, uh, there's going to be a really serious chance for, for Morgan to score. Premier League began when we have in 1888, 1998, 1992, or 1995? 92. So again, 92. And the answer, of course, is correct. So, oh, I love it. Arsenal will regain possession in their half of the pitch. And now it comes time for another chance, another uh, decision. So, so we already have the decision from Leeds. I'm going to go left. Okay. Well, ball is played out to the left flank. And Marcelo Bielsa's Leeds have read it all wrong, unfortunately. And they have pressed the wrong way. On the opposite side of the pitch. So you now have possession in the park. The left side, your left midfielder, left winger has the ball. Uh, so now mm -hmm. you can either continue straight down the flank. You can go sent, you can cut in centrally, or you can switch the play. <laughs> right side. Switch. Oof. And again, Leeds defending. That man marking is shambles. Because <laughs> as Leeds hurry and shift and press to their, to their right, the left side of Arsenal's attacking uh, It's like playing position. Liverpool here. Christ. Tyrese will switch the ball <laughs> to the right side of the park. And now uh, you have a chance to score. And the scoring opportunity will be an uh, answer of a question. Nicola Pepe with a chance to score. Uh, add to his number of few tallies in the Premier League. Um, however, you have to ask the, you have to answer this question correctly, mm -hmm. and it is question: Which World Cup 2018 match featured the first use of VAR? A. Russia versus Saudi Arabia. B. France versus Australia. Or C. Spain versus Portugal. Again, which World Cup 2018 match featured the first? Utilization of VAR. France and Australia. Is that so, your final answer? Yeah, because I remember it was Pogba Griezmann with the shot. I remember. And Nicola Pepe wakes in and tries a shot, and unfortunately, just wide as Leeds will see and happy to go scoreless long into the match. Spain versus Portugal. Spain versus was it? Portugal, mate. Yeah. Oh, I remember it so well as well. It was Pop of the show. I remember. It was Group C, wasn't it? Yeah. Spain, Spain, Portugal was Group B. Right. So that was a nice little warm up. You look a bit warm, Tyrese. Look a I bit. am warm. I He's am warmed warm. up. He's warmed up. Let's find out a bit mm. more about you. So to take us, take us through kind of your journey, because um, obviously we know you're in Nottingham Forest now. Uh, mm -hmm. So kind of take us through how you kind of got from. You know, playing football, just mm. you know, locally with the local team, to playing for Nottingham Forest. Uh, started playing football when I was about three. Just remember vividly. I don't remember fully, but vividly, I remember that like, my brother was playing and uh, with his best friend Patrick at the time, and uh, it was like literally a park, not where I live now. It was like my first house, so North Woolwich, uh, East London. So um, I remember they were playing in the park and then my, my dad was kind of like, obviously looking after me and stuff and my, and my brother, because we used to go to the park all the time. But um, the park was actually where like Jay, my older brother and like Patrick were playing. And I just like started watching like my brother and like, 
I just kind of like had this enthusiasm to kind of like go in there and like play myself. Obviously, I was too young, but um, I remember my dad had a ball in the park as well. It was like a, a meat, meat tray ball. So like them balls back in the day, they were quite hard. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, so, they're, um, they're hard, man. Especially when you they buy were them. hard to kick. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I remember like struggling to like kick the ball to my dad, and then like, um, yeah, it just started from there. So I moved to Canning Town when I was about six, where I live now, where my family live actually. And then um, from there, I met my best friend when I was about yeah six or seven, and then he knew that I was quite good at football, so he was just like, "Oh, Tyrese, like." Um, my dad runs a Sunday league team called Ripway, so do you want to come along and then sign? And I said, yeah, that's fine. So um, I did that, but um, the agreement was for me to actually um, like have like someone to take me to the games because obviously Sunday league matches are obviously on a Sunday, hence why it's called Sunday league. But um, yeah. obviously and I, my family are Christian, so it's always a conflict of interest because it's like, you either go to church or you play football. And at the yeah. time, I was so young. I remember my mum my used to say to me that, like, oh, like, you need to have someone to take you because I'm, I'm not going to be able to take you. Neither is my dad, do you know what I mean, at the time. So um, the agreement was for me to go there, but to have someone to, like, pick me up and obviously drop me back so I can make it in time for church. And I remember yeah. my best friend's uh, parents were like, yeah, we'll do that, that's fine, do you know what I mean? Because they knew how yeah. good I was and they knew how much I wanted to play with, like, obviously sure. my mates and stuff. Yeah, did that for about three or four years and then club started watching me and then West So it's about was, like when you were like, you know, yeah, like you're like 10 or 11 years old, like kind of yeah. going into secondary school. That's when you first had scouts coming to your Sunday yeah. league games. Yeah, that's when it kind of like ramped up a bit. Like I remember West Ham and Brentford were like fighting to get me on a trial and I had to choose between uh, one of them two teams. And I remember... I kind of swayed towards West Ham because obviously West Ham is like my local club yeah. and like my best friend Sammy supports West Ham. Like it would have been good for me, do you know what I mean? But things happen. So I ended up going to Brentford first. I went to Brentford when I was like 11 or 12. So I think it was literally my first week in a secondary school and I went there because I remember uh, Brentford's quite far. So I had to rush down from that school. My school was in Essex, Romford. So I remember I had oh, to wow. rush down from school and actually, funny enough, my school is actually right next to West Ham training ground, you know. Oh, it's mad. <laughs> yeah, 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 it's mad. Must it's mad how, ideal. You know, it's mad how things work out. But yeah, that happened now. And uh, rushed down from like school. I remember last period, like three o'clock, uh, you're always trying to get on the like, first train on the first bus. But obviously, when you're young, like you've got a lot of things going on. You've got um, school, you've got football and stuff. So I think it was hard for me because obviously the travelling, it kind of took a toll on me, you know, going yeah. from like school to obviously football is hard, especially like yep. if you had a bad day at the school, you, like you're kind of not in the mood and stuff. For sure. And uh, yeah, I did that, and I was still going through growth spurts and things, but obviously I had lots of like technical ability and stuff. Like people could see that I was really like neat and tidy on the ball, so I think that's what attracted people to me. But um, I went there. The first few weeks were fine. I think towards the end. I kind of like didn't express myself, and I've always prided myself on like expressing myself and playing. Do you think it was? Like, is it like? Would you say it's harder, like going to like from like just playing kind of Sunday league training a bit during the week to going to like a proper club and trying to like you know get involved there and, and make your mark yeah. there? Was it very? Because it's going to be a different you know level of ability and quality there. Yeah, like when I I remember the first week I went there, there was like boys like maybe double the size of me and I was I wasn't the tallest but I wasn't the smallest I, I think I had a, like average size to me but um I remember the boys were like physically quite mature at that age you know I've seen a few boys with like beards already and I was thinking hold on a minute you can't be 12 do you know what I mean but <laughs> yeah yeah anyway it's crazy like they were my age and stuff and like you're kind of competing and you know what London's like like it's full of like talented boys and they're always competing to like show you know the, the scouts especially and the yep. coach is what you can do, do you know what I mean? But it was tough because, like, London boys especially, they have a hunger to kind of succeed. So you're battling against, like, boys similar to you, to yourself, do you know what I mean? And it's not easy. So for me, that was kind of, like, daunting, I remember, because I, I've never been through that, you know. And obviously seeing the level 
you know, the levels that you had to be at to kind of like get in. Yeah, it was really daunting. But for me, it was all an experience, you know what I mean? Because it's made sure. who I am today. So, yeah. yeah, so how how long how long were you at Brentford before things kind of progressed from there? What was the next part of your, your journey um, towards kind of where you I are now? I went to Brentford, but unfortunately for me at that, t- at that stage, I wasn't quite ready to like go to the next step and play academy football. So Brentford was just like, Unfortunately, like Tyrese not got in, but it's like all kind of like monitor you. So I was thinking, monitor, like, no, I'm not coming back. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> so I went back to Sunday League, obviously knowing that I wasn't quite ready like, for that next step. And that was tough because I remember all the boys looked up to me in the team um, at that age and I was like, oh, this boy, he's definitely going to make it. So from going from being bigged up to like kind of like being shut down by like a yeah. professional club, and that's the first club I kind of went to professionally as well yeah it was tough but um my, my dad and my, especially my mom as well both of them they always taught me to be thick skinned people in life they always have opinions of you but if you allow that opinion to define who you are then you know you're not going to get anywhere do you know what I mean so yeah I that's to them as well even to this day I just try and be myself and not change do you know what I mean so yeah for real. I took that back so, into Sunny League yeah so who are the next kind of team to come along later um, on Later on, I was 13 and I went to Norwich on trial. And okay. the same thing, like, they liked the way I played, but I just didn't think I was ready. So that for me was like another, like, shot, like, to my chest. Yeah. You know I mean? Because it's like, I felt ready, but it's just maybe they didn't think I was there. Cup of tea, do you know what I mean? And that's, that's yeah. football, isn't it? Everyone has opinions. So. For sure. But you I keep pushing, keep grinding. You keep grinding, yeah, and then yeah, exactly. when does exactly. when does your when did would you say your first kind of proper opportunity came along? Uh, my first opportunity was really actually, uh, well, I, I could say Reading because I actually played for Reading for like a year and a bit, but Reading was kind of messed up. The situation was messed up because um, the academy chief died, so um, bless him. Oh, wow. His name was Eamon Dolls, and um, Eamon like was kind of the guy that pushed me into like signing for Reading at the time and then he died because he had cancer and stuff and I was about 15 yeah I was 15 when that happened and then obviously like players started leaving um boys were like getting bought from like Manchester City and stuff like that so like so Reading obviously yeah didn't work out and then I went to Brighton where Brighton okay yeah so I went to Brighton so Reading they didn't release me but they said like I don't really have a contract there, so I can go anywhere. So I just chose maybe Brighton was probably the best place for me. They put a okay. like, a plan for me for the next three years because I was about 16. No, I wasn't 16. I was 15 at the time, turning 16. So they put a plan out for me for the next three years, um, like what they think I can develop, the things I'm really good at, and like kind of that pathway between like academy football into like first team football there. And how did and that go? I remember go? the manager... Funny enough, the manager's actually gone back to my parent club, so he's um, Chris Hutton, and he was raised in oh. London like myself. So yeah, but I met circle. him. Yeah, I met him on the first week I was on trial at Brighton, and I think he watched one of my games and he said that no, nah, he likes me a lot. He, he's obviously heard that I'm from the East End as well, so he said for me, he's like, I need to be knocking on the door by the first year or that year, you know, that I saw him basically knocking on the door, training the first team and such, because like they feel like I've got massive potential and things like that. So these are all things I wanted to hear. And then when I got there, it was tough because obviously you come in, into a new club and then they've got boys that they kind of want to push on into that environment as well, as long as yourself. Like they have your competing with boys, you know, that as, as good as you, but they also see massive futures for. And obviously yeah. I've come from a different club where some of them have been there from like nine or 10 or 11. Do you know what I mean? So they kind of like, the pressure I got was kind of like they wanted to push their own. And when I was there, they were pushing me, but I didn't feel that pushed, if that makes sense. I felt like, yeah, like... Yeah, when you say their own, you mean like ones that have been in the system for a bit longer than I've been than in you. the system for a bit longer than me. Okay. And seeing that was kind of discouraging for me because I felt like at the time, I was probably slightly better in terms of ability. I was a lot better, but yeah. obviously, like, coaches have their own opinions. Like, I don't fault them. Obviously... Brighton did show me a lot of respect and things, but it was like a thing. I didn't want to be part of the numbers, do you know what I mean? I didn't want to be that. I wanted to feel like I had some sort of pathway into the first team. And obviously, yeah. 
I remember Chris was there and things like that. I had a few meetings with him and whatnot. And it's just kind of um, like disillusioning for me. I just felt like there was nothing going to happen at this club. So I just said to my agent at the time, you know, I've left now, but um, he was my agent at the time. I just said, like, look, I want to find a new club because like, right now I'm not happy and things like that. And then I think the last year of my contract, they offered me a one-year pro. And I was just like, no, I don't want to take it. So I was just sitting out waiting for like my agent to find something better. And then uh, Nottingham Forest came calling, I think on the month that I was like, telling them I'm not going to renew my deal, um, they came calling. Uh, Chris Cohen, who's now the assistant manager at um, Luton, Luton Town uh, in the Championship, he called my agent, who's met, who they're, like, they're mates, basically. So they were having dialogue about me and things like that. And they were watching my games on that like, Y Scout. So they had my games on Y Scout, they're watching it and they liked me. So I came on trial, I think for one week. But it was like kind of like they offered me something, but they wanted to kind of see me first as well. So I had the offer and then I went there and I impressed that caddy manager who I get on well with now. And um yeah, they had a meeting with me after like my first game and said, Yeah, like we definitely want you, blah blah. So they offered me three years. And signed it. I've never looked back. I've been out for it ever since. And you know, went on last season to make my debut for the first team against Chelsea. So I've progressed yeah. really well. When you signed, so you signed. I see here late 2018, right, with Nottingham Forest. Yeah, so I signed when I was 17, 18. You were there a little bit, and then they sent you. I think was it last year to Portugal. I'm I, ever yeah. since. Uh, Morgan, you know, brought you up. That's been something that's really interested me in terms of the move to Casa Pia. Is that how you call it? What's the yeah, pronunciation? Yeah, yeah. Casa Pia. So, <laughs> how did that come up? Even before you left, when did you first hear that there was a possibility uh, for you to go to Portugal? And how was the whole experience from arriving there and, and, and your t- short time there? For me, that was different, you know. I'll be honest, because I was expecting to go there at the start. I had a few clubs interested. Um like League One championship clubs that were looking at me to take my loan and things. But obviously, circumstances behind closed doors at the club at Forest, for some reason, they didn't want me to go there. Like, I was kind of being told that, yeah, they wanted me to stay around the building, like, continue being the first team and such. And I, I, to be honest, I didn't mind that, you know, because at that stage, I felt like I needed to still be in around, you know, the gaffer's eye and maybe get another few games in the championship and then kick on from there, then maybe the next, the following year, probably like push on to be on loan, like now where I'm at. Do you know what I mean? So I, I was fine with that. And then I think Sunderland, Blackpool, um, Birmingham, there was a few clubs I got turned down. And then by then I was just like, look, I'm going to stay here. Do you know what I mean? And then the last week, I think, no. So I made my debut at this point. Yeah, I made my debut at this point. And I was just like looking to kick on. And then... um. I remember my agent at the time was like, um, there's an option between Oxford and then Casapia. I was like, I don't know what you want to do, but I think like Casapia will be better for you because like you've always wanted to go abroad and things like that, which that was a main thing for me, just to like try something different. Do you know what I mean? To go abroad, learn a different language, um, be in a new environment and play a different style of football that you know I'm accustomed to in England. Obviously, like foreign football. Anyone that watched me watch me play, do you know what I mean? I'm more suited to throwing football because I like to play and I'm a bit of um what's the word? A register. So in my position, like I like to dictate play and like be calm on the ball and I play at my own pace, do you know what I mean? And what position do you can, play, just so everyone knows? So I'm a holding midfield player. So um I'll say I'm a bit mo- a bit more modern than most holding midfield players. So I like to come deep and obviously receive the ball, turn and play forward. And I've got good passing range. I can pass with both feet. Um, I can dribble, I can run with the ball. So I can do a bit of everything, I can shoot. But for me, it was just like, I just wanted to go and like showcase myself out abroad and then people can kind of like see me out there doing well and then I'll come back to England and hopefully kick on. And I went there yeah. now and I started playing the games. And there was lots of things going on. And like it was a bit unsettling for me because I went there now and I was treated nice by the club and everything. And um like I played the games and that and I was doing quite well to be honest. But it was just like a thing. I wasn't quite settled, like where I was staying and stuff like Yeah. Like the area and such. I didn't quite like it. Even though Portugal was nice and where I was, Lisbon was really nice. 
I just want to resettle there. So things are going on behind the pitch. Lots of noise being said. And I said, I'll get my head down. And then um, and I'll come back from the loan. It was good for me, though, because that was my first experience of, like, men's football, do you know what I mean? And, and for me... Regular as well, physical. regular football. Regular football as well. Because, obviously, yeah. I was in and out of the 23s and first team. So I trained the first team every day and then dropped back down with the 23s to play. And sometimes that can be demoralising because, like, you know, whatever you do in first team training, like, you're going to go back down to 23s and play for them. Because realistically, like, the manager at the time probably doesn't trust you to play with the big boys. Obviously, he knows you've got a lot of potential and ability. So he throws you in the deep end against Chelsea. And then I went from Stamford Bridge to playing, like, I don't know, back at the city ground for the 23s. It's, like, demoralising. I didn't yeah. really want to do that for, like, the rest of the season. So yeah, I took course. on that challenge and I felt like I did well. If I'm being honest, I was unsettled off the pitch. It's hard, isn't it? Because, yeah. like, I can certainly relate, you know, moving to Canada for university. Yeah. Um, and it's it's different to what you'd expect. Like, even mm. Portugal, you think, okay, they speak a different language. But apart from that, how different can it be? But everything they do is so different. And trying to, like, yeah, adjust. People forget that. Like, when footballers go anywhere... And I, I think you're starting to see it more like English players going abroad. You know, Jaden Sancho is probably the, the most high-profile example. Mm-hmm. Um, maybe you look and look at Aaron Ramsey in Italy. Mm-hmm. And there's more players, but it's, an, it's a big... I mean, Gareth Bale going to M- Madrid as well. It's a, massive, it's a massive adjustment because you have to get used to yeah. a completely different way of life. And it's harder when you're going on loan because you know you're not going to stay there. So it's like you realise mm. that it's going to take time to adjust. It's hard to adjust, but you know that you're not necessarily going to be there for, mm. for that long. So it's like, well, by the time I adjust, I'm coming back anyway. So it's, it's a hard kind of middle yeah, ground. Did, would you say one. you found it hard? I like being a, you know, around them type of people, the ones that I care about. Do you know what I mean? I love that. Yeah. Like, I feel like Portugal was tougher because obviously the whole COVID thing kicked in quite quickly. And it was hard because it, like we made arrangements and such for this to happen, that to happen. And like we couldn't quite do that. And then uh, it was kind of like stuck in the middle because that the Portuguese people they wanted to continue the league, but financially it just wasn't possible for them. And obviously, like they were the second division, not the first division, so it was just yeah. really tough. And I remember we had to, I had to kind of like make a decision to, to come back early because obviously between. Like myself, Forrest, and then um, the two clubs, there was lots of conflict because I came back early than everyone else. And obviously Forrest, like, in my head saying that, yeah, they need me to come back. Because when football restarts, I'll be around the team and such, and then I'll get opportunities to play in the camp um, towards the end of the season, which I was looking forward to. And then like, I got back now, and I remember lockdown was so tough because, like... <laughs> I was having to do a lot, like, lots of, like, training at home and things like that to, like, get myself back fit. So when the championship restarts, I'm ready to kind of, like, go back and kick on and maybe yeah. get a few more games for, like, Forrest and the champ. I was ready for that. The manager spoke to me, Sabi Lumucci, who gave me my debut. And unfortunately, like, he's been passed over by the club. But, um, yeah, it kind of, like, gave me my first opportunity to be with the first team and such on a, on a regular basis. And... I can't find the guy enough, you know, I can't find the man enough, you know, as as a person and as a, you know, a coach, I can't find him enough. But obviously, like, we, we had conversations and such and he was watching me out in Portugal and I felt like I was kind of, like, getting towards where I needed to be at first. And then, um, like, the, I think the fever, like, they made this rule that um, if you go out abroad and you play games, no matter what division it is, like you're not allowed to come back to England and play. I thought that was ridiculous. I thought it was ridiculous. And, and that whole rule would just it had my head flying. I just couldn't believe it. Like, yeah. So and the things that were that were being told to me, I was just yeah, it was just a joke. So basically, I did all that training for no reason, and then I ended up staying a bit longer back down south in London, and my head was gone. And my head was just scrambled because it's like you prepare yourself so much. That, like you're looking forward to going back and showing everyone what you could do. And like you just don't get the opportunity to and it's out of your hands, it's out of everyone's hands. Like you, it's nothing you can do for that forest, you know what I mean? So yeah. It's tough. And then like the manager's just telling me to be patient because when I come back pre season, like you've got plans for you, things like that. So I was like I was like, yeah. okay, like I'm not out of his picture, do you know what I mean? Because sometimes yeah, yeah, you yeah. get out of his picture. So I was like, Okay, I'm still in his head, do you know what I mean? 
So obviously the season planned out, we didn't make playoffs and everyone was like having a bit of a stinker basically at Forest and it was tough because obviously that's the club that I care about. That's the club I've come through the ranks at and yeah. it wasn't easy seeing that. But um, for me, I kind of wanted that, you know, that thing to show like when I come back now that I can make that impact on the team. Should we do a quick, yeah, let's go, go back, back to, to the game, yeah, the game yeah, and see if we can get the opening goal either way. Uh, Leeds, definitely. Leeds possession as they will go from a goal kick. I'm going to go right. Well, unfortunately, um, pressing the wrong way as Morgan's goalkeeper will play out to the right back. Oh. And Morgan, one more round, see if you can play it in the midfield. Okay, so again, you can press left, right, or central. Uh, central. There we go. Morgan did play central and will get punished. So, answer the question correctly. So, <laughs> you cheeky. Little. All right. Why do I read you so well? It's actually bad. I'll give you a nice and a nice smooth one here. Question: Who is the all-time leading Premier League scorer? Premier League Ooh, scorer. That's a tough one. That. A. Wayne Rooney. B. Terry Henry. Throw him under the C, bus here. Alan Shearer. Ooh. Alan Shearer. One back possession centrally in the midfield. And Thank it will you. be a quick counter. Yeah, left, incredible. right or central. Left, right or central. Which way will you go? Uh, left. Another scoring chance as the ball is in a dangerous area. Aubameyang will look to finish. But... The answer has to be right. So, question for the opening goal in this game. David Goodwillie, Fabian Asman, and Paul Dickoff were all professional footballers. True or false? That's David Goodwillie, Fabian Asman, and Paul Dickoff. Yo, Ryan, you're killing me here. Do me a favour. 50-50, <laughs> mate. 50-50. David Asman. Who the flip is that? I've never, ever heard of that name. You're winding me up, isn't it? <laughs> you know David uh, Willie. You know that one. That's for sure. I know that one. So. Dundee, You all know that one. Legend. Paul Dickoff. Legend. Blackburn. Absolute legend, mate. David Willie. Where have I heard that name? I don't think I've heard of that. <laughs> Some village, maybe, in Germany. Not, not true. Not true. Not true. They were and Leeds, Leeds will again, Aubameyang takes it with his left and unfortunately just misses the goal. Oh, as the game my God. Is still scoreless. Why Shocking stuff. And it will be a goal kick to Leeds and we will continue it later. I'm the first person from midfield or defence, wherever you want to put it, um, that gets a ball moving forward. And that's important yeah. in that position to be able to get the ball moving forward. For sure. Not to lose the ball and be, you know, the ball retention in that position has to be like almost 100%. Do you know what I mean? It's important to keep the ball yeah. in that position and be calm. Yeah. And obviously I had all them attributes, but it was like, it's just trying to find myself. Even though I was really good at what I did before, I think ever since I moved into that position, maybe... When I turned 18, yeah, when I turned 18, I moved to that position. I, I just went from this level to like a whole different level. Like something remember, clicked. Yeah, something just clicked. So I started yeah. impressing like the first team manager. The first first team manager wasn't Sabri. It was um, actually Roy Keane and Martin O'Neill. So they took me on pre-season tour with the first team to Spain. But it was off the back of like them thinking that I was one of the brightest products in the academy. So it was me, Alex Might, and Brennan Johnson, Arvin Apaya, Jaden Richardson, Joe Shelby. There was quite a few of the young lads, you know, that they felt needed to be pushed on into the first team setting. So that was my first experience being with the first team. But like obviously before then, 
like kind of like playing with the twenty threes and being with the twenty threes. But obviously, when I got the opportunity to train the first team, I I showcased what I could do. Yeah. You know, from then on, like they kind of took note of my name and things, and then I started training the first team more and more. So every time there was a player in my position that was injured, I was the first name they thought of, and then from there, I just kind of stayed in their picture. Um, if we go back, something that came up when you were talking, you had the opportunity to to be coached by Martin O'Neill, yeah, uh, who who did a great job. I thought he did a really good job with the Irish um, national team, Rep- Republic of Ireland, mm-hmm. and obviously mm-hmm. the the fact that they have a little bit of a different approach, at least from an outsider's perspective, with Roy yeah. Keane there as well. Um, can you talk about a little bit about how they function as a coaching staff, how you found them, obviously, being in that 23.5 role? Um, and you, what do you, what do you, what's your thoughts on, on Martin O'Neill and co? For me, uh, as soon as I walked in the building, it was just kind of like a refreshing feeling because I remember um, you guys will know him well. He's, he's gone on to, to do good things before his first team now. Um, Ryan Yates, I remember. Yeah. Yates, he was going through a bad patch because I remember he, he came back from uh, alone in the summer and he did quite well, actually. He played in League One, I think. He did well there. Came back and there was kind of like a buzz around him because he had pre-season and um, he played in the first game, I think, Carabao Cup and he did quite well, to be fair. He didn't put a foot wrong. Um, did well that game and it was kind of there was kind of talk because I remember Karanka was there at the time but for some reason, he just didn't fancy him. So he came back down to the 23s and he was doing the 23.5. Like he was training with the first team every day, but playing for the 23s. And at 22, I think he was like 21 or 22, by myself now, he's kind of getting to that stage where he needs to be playing week in, week out, you know, in mm-hmm. the champ or, you know, going to a league one club, going back down in the division, playing there permanently, knowing that he's going to play every week and, you know, for him, it was tough because he had the decision to make. I think Portsmouth and Mill, they were interested. They looked at him and I think his agent called him saying that Karanka is not going to allow him to go. And he was so angry because I remember the next day we we had training, the 23s. I dropped that down. I remember, like, looking at him and he was just gone. Like, his head was just flying because, obviously, he done well a bit, like, pre-season, done well when he went alone. And you're yeah. thinking, this is now my season to kind of play. And it just didn't happen for him. And then at what point did Martin, Martin come into the picture? Then Martin came in January and obviously Yates, he didn't play one minute under Karanka. After the cup game, I mean, especially when he got knocked out, Karanka got um, the sack. And, and then uh, Martin came in and as soon as Martin came in, he gave Yates the opportunity, Yates he took it and he just stayed in the team. Like, no one could say anything to Yates after that. And I remember Arvin was getting more opportunities as well. Arvin made his debut um, in the cup against Burton Albion, if I'm correct, and he scored. I remember because it was 3 2. We won 3 2. He came in, made a difference into the team, and there was kind of like a freshness around like everyone. Like, everyone was starting to say that, oh, mine, if you do well, uh, and even if you're playing 23s or 18s or, you know, 16s, even, if you do well and Martin or Roy is watching you and they're there, maybe just for a few minutes and they like you, you've got an opportunity to like kind of get into the first yeah. team. It kind of motivated everyone all the way through, like all the age groups, yeah. to because because yeah. it was gonna get noticed. It was actually mm. mo- it motivates you to put the effort in. That's what I'm getting. Yeah, I I felt that I felt that because even me at the time, like I just felt Karenka just it's not gonna happen. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. So when mine came in, obviously when I heard Roy was part of the coaching staff, like Roy Keane is a legend. Like everyone knows Roy Keane. If you don't know Roy Keane, you don't know football, do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Like yeah. My mum was a massive United fan. Like my mum was really, really passionate about United and she loved Roy Keane. No one, like, even though people might have a perception of him, he actually was far from it. Like he's doing actually, actually the complete opposite. I found him to be really, really good. Good for me, especially because he was a midfielder. Yeah. Uh, at the time, I was still a box to box midfielder, so I was more like attack minded. Do you know what I mean? So at that time, he was really good with me because he was coaching me, giving me tips, and obviously, he was watching my games and he liked me from the get go. Um, he liked the attributes that I brought into the 23s, and you know, he, he was kind of the one that said to like Jimmy Gilligan and Chris Cohen at the time, 
we need to get this boy into the first team set up. So I started training with them every day. And um, yeah, I kind of like went under like Ben Watson's wing. Ben Watson was obviously the captain at the time for the first team. And he's a London boy from uh, Campbell down south. So um, he kind of like spotted me and like saw that I had something. And he, he was kind of good for me. He mentored me, you know. He taught me, you know, things you had to be like, you know, the demands of training. And obviously you have to kind of play that role as I was like starting to realise, you know, I might have to play a bit deeper. Do you know what I mean? To get to yeah. the top level, I might have to play more as a like number four, number six, you call it. And and Watto was really good with me. You know, even Roy Keane, you know, they, they were saying that, you know, that this boy, he's got a real, real chance to play at the top, top level. And hearing that from Roy Keane, it meant a lot to me at the time. So I was just taking that advice and going back. When I ever, whenever I went back with the 23s, I was taking that on board and just bossing games. I remember um, the last game of the season for the 23s, Jimmy Gilligan pulled me into his office and I had the biggest grin because I kind of knew. There was a bit of a buzz around me at the time, you know, going on tour the pre, um, with the first team for pre-season. But it yeah. was kind of confirmed by Jimmy. And Jimmy called my, my dad as well when I had gone home. Was the last game of the um, the year, and uh, he kind of just said, "Look, um, Tyrese is gonna go away the first team in Spain." Kind of like yeah. for like the first team to kind of like give him an opportunity to see whether you know he's quite cut out to be with them full time and things. And I, I was so excited, do you know what I mean? And then I don't know if you know about this or remember this, but he came in for pre season for like two three weeks and. Um, there was quite a lot of talk about Martin and Roy. Roy didn't come back. When we came back for pre-season, Roy was just gone. Like, he didn't come back. We we heard that he resigned. Whether that's true or not, I don't know. But um, it's not really for us to talk about as players. We just get on with what we've been told, do you know what I mean? Yeah. So we were told did much he change? Did much change with that? Like, how did you... Obviously, you said you, you, you liked Roy and... Uh, yeah, guys, I got like, him real well with him. We had a good relationship, yeah. yeah. And it was tough for me because... He was kind of the one that really, really rated me, you know, at the club and saw me and he was like, yeah, this boy, he has to be the first thing, do you know what I mean? So from seeing that and, you know, hearing that and then, you know, coming back and you're thinking, oh, like Roy is going to kind of like push me on. Uh, and then hearing that he kind of like left, it was it was gut-wrenching for me. Like I just thought, yeah. like, oh, oh, fuck, you know, like I have to start again. Sorry for my language. Yeah, that's the thing, because when managers come and go, it's like yeah. your your opportunity, like an opportunity that didn't exist suddenly comes, you know, mm. when they arrive, as you're kind of talking about when the pair came in. But then yeah. equally so, over time, when they go, everything you build up just gets lost. It's not like the other manager comes in and it carries on from that exact same point. You have to no. you have to start all again because he has his own ways of belief. He he doesn't sit down with the old manager and say, "Right, catch me no. up where we at." He just comes in and does his own thing. Especially for a young player like myself, I was eighteen or nineteen at the time, and um, I didn't play one single minute of first team football for them to actually spot. Oh, maybe this boy should stay with the first team. You're you're so unsure of where things could go. Do you know what I mean? Because things can go west, things can go in your favour. You just don't know. And yeah. obviously, um. I, at, at the time, I didn't hear of like Sabri Mucci. I'll be honest, I didn't know who he was. He came in um, pre-season when we went to Spain. I travelled with them, me, Brennan, all the young lads um, that were around the first team at the time. We we travelled and um, he came in and there was just an aura about him. Like, he was really, really confident, but really driven and really, really de- demanding like training sessions. Like, yeah, everything had to be around the football, even like the running. It had to involve a football, so of course. that was different compared to like Roy and uh, Martin. No disrespect, they were kind of old school, very regimented on their own way. And um, nowadays, in modern football, it doesn't quite work with like players. And yeah, you know that was kind of like found out. And you know their top top, you know coaches, they were top with me. I would never ever yeah. say a bad thing about them, but it's a thing where, you know, as a young player in and around that environment, you can sort of like see the way the boys are interacting with, you know, coach, and you can feel like there's a bit of tension, especially with certain players that I can't yeah. name, but it's just a bit weird. I'm like, I remember feeling a bit like uncomfortable going in. 
Yeah, I want to I wanna ask you, so you were talking, you know, right at the beginning, you said how yeah. you you want to be, um, you, you know, or you would be a football agent if, if you know, your career hasn't, or hadn't taken off like it has. Mm. Um, like, how, how have things been, what's it like working with an agent? Um, you talked about, obviously, at a time, um, you had kind of a choice between going to Portugal um, and maybe going to Oxford, and you said, like, your agent kind of, recommended to go to Portugal um so like was that kind of your determining factor uh when you go there and obviously looking back you said maybe it wasn't the right the right choice so like how and and did you like have any resentment towards him given that like he was the one pushing you to go out um and it obviously you know football went well but it didn't fully work out for you from that perspective of settling um... down I don't really have resentment like, or towards people because I've always had this mindset, life moves on, football moves on, people move on. That's just the way it is. I'm not going to be yeah. angry with Ian when I have kids and when I have a family and when I'm successful and, and you know, money and stuff. I'm not going to be angry. I'm not even going to be thinking of Ian. I want to be like Ian who? Do you know what I mean? Like, no disrespect to him. Like, it was tough leaving him, do you know what I mean? Because I'd been with him since I was like 16, 17 and my family, you know, trusted him. We, we all got on well with him. But it got to a point where I just felt the way I was going and the way I, my career needed to go, I just didn't feel like he was the right person for me. Didn't so how recently How like recently was this when you... How recently was was this, like, after... So after... When you came back from Portugal? So this like, is when I came back, yeah. I made a decision. And obviously, I remember there was times when I was doubting whether I'd made the right choice or not and I still wasn't 100% sure but in my head I knew something needed to change and it wasn't yeah. me it was definitely the agent I needed to get rid of and as I, I again as I said it's no disrespect to him because he's obviously a good agent if he wasn't a good agent he won't be working for the company he works for so for me it was just I needed something different I needed someone that's a bit more savvy a bit you know so and a bit more with like an aura about them that you, you know you can listen to them respect them and trust their judgment that was the main thing for me trust their judgment because sometimes when you're young you can make a decision and not kind of like feel it i feel like you're by yourself when you make a decision like something's put on you you either go or you don't go and with the age that i've gone with now i've never ever felt like that i've never felt pushed to do something that i don't want to do it's always yeah. been you know, we will go with what you want to do, but we'll put this on the table and it's your career. You make the choice. We'll yeah. support you no matter what and, and do whatever we can for you to make sure that, you know, you perform the best you can on the pitch. And, it's, and, it, and you know, all these little things, they're all a one percenter to, to make the player feel like, not confident, but to make the player feel like he needs to just do whatever he's doing and then yeah. turn off, off the pitch you know, leave it to them and they handle For sure. It's not about, yeah, like, good, making yeah. decisions for you. It's about yeah. giving you all the right tools to make the decisions. Yeah. And it sounds like maybe yeah. with the old agent, uh, Ian, that he was maybe, you know, making, not making decisions, but maybe pushing decisions too much and not allowing you to, and just rather than just giving you the tools to then make those decisions yourself. Because at the end of the day, yeah. as you said, it's, it's your career. I kind of felt like, obviously, maybe because I've been with him since I was young, I kind of felt like baby by him a bit. And where I was going, obviously, I just got into the first team environment at Forest and I was considered a first team player now, not a boy. So that's where I was. And for him, I feel like he had been so used to me being that little boy from the academy. And, you know, he knew where I was going to go in my career. And I feel that's why it hurt him for me to leave him. But for me, it just wasn't about the personal relationship that we had. It was more to do with myself and where I needed to go for myself and my family. That's what I was thinking about when I made the decision, not just myself. So I think when I was kind of like talking to him about kind of like going my own separate way yeah. and, you know, I've got a person I'm going to go with and things, he was kind of like salty, which is normal. And I don't blame him. But, you know, when you invest in a player, it's tough and you, and you get that connection with someone it was tough but if I remember correctly when I was in Portugal there was things going on and I'm not someone that likes to talk bad about things or to make things public and gossip I'm not one of these people obviously there was things going on in Portugal that I wasn't too 
aware of and okay with, if I'm being honest. And I kind of just bit my tongue and just left it, let it be because he was like, obviously, I knew for the short term I'm going to be back at Forest. And then when I'm back at Forest now, I'll be back at my home. You know, this is my yeah. club, do you know what I mean? This is where, you know, I know I have a, a big future. So I just had that in, in mind. So I said, let me wait until I come back now. So I, I waited and waited um, to see how Ian would be, you know, and things like that and how things would change and things. And for me, things were almost being like starting to happen a bit too late for me. So I just said, no, like, I have to. And obviously now the person I've gone with, like, I'm really happy. I trust him. Yep. You know, his family have looked after me and, you know, he's always made sure that, you know, he's done what he needed to do for me and it had to be the right decision for me, not for him. Even for sure. though he's very successful and, you know, he's had top, top players, which, you know, I, sh- I strive and, you know, aim to be as, just as good as, if not better. You know, I feel like he has so much faith in, in me, which makes me just kind of, when I go on the pitch, just kind of like showing why, he did what he did to kind of like get me on board with him. So yeah, for me, it means a lot to me, Jeremy. You know I mean? So I'll just, yeah. I'll just do that. Well, we can go <laughs> in and see if Leeds can counter and punish Arsenal for the two glorious opportunities that were missed. So Morgan, goal kick for Leeds. Uh, so we know the drill. Uh, write it in the chat where you're going to go and then Reversely, we can see where Arsenal will press. The stage is yours, Ty. Where are you going to go? Uh, right. And the ball hasn't played to the right flank for Leeds, and the ball will stay in possession for Leeds. So, no, where will they go now? Okay, so we got Morgan's answer. Just waiting now for Ty. Which way will he press? I'm going to stick with right. Good. Good answer, mate. Win the ball back. Tried to trick me. You read him like a cat, mate. Yeah, well, you got to answer the question yet, mate. You're not done (laughs) very well there. Why are you trying to trick me, man? (laughs) Why? So, question... Who won the most EPL titles in the past decade? That is 2010 to 2019. A, Chelsea. B, Man United. C, Manchester City. Or D, Wickham Wanderers. (laughs) This is shocking choices. That's Chelsea, Man United, Man City or Wickham. Between Chelsea and Man City, I'm sure it's either Chelsea or Man City, but I don't want to take the gamble. This is very I'm important. Like an absolute mug. I'm going for Man City. Answer Man City. The correct answer was indeed Man City. Ball one back in the midfield area. And it is on the right flank. Indeed, mm. now it's where we're looking. Um, Ty, are you going to go straight, switch the pitch, or central? Uh, straight. Yeah. Morgan said central. Morgan say? Central. Yeah, shame, so you're fine. Shame, <laughs> you may as well get this one right, mate. Real Madrid have oh. by far won the most European titles with 13 Ooh. in total. Ooh. However, who is behind them with seven? Teams. Seven. A. Options, yeah. Insert Milan. Yeah. B. A. C. Milan. B. Or D- C, rather. Bayern Munich. Or D. Liverpool Football Club. That's A. Insert B. A. C. C. Oh, Bayern Munich. You're or doing D, this. Liverpool. Don't do this. You're throwing me under the bus here because basically all of them clubs are actually top of that list. They're very close. That is mad. Oh, yo. Oh, mate. Not easy to score against this lead side, mate. Don't know why you're looking over there, Ty. The the answer's not behind you, Tyrese. Give me the choice again, please. I can't get this wrong. A. So the question is, Real Madrid have won, obviously, the most. Who's behind them in second place with seven? 
A, Inter Milan, B, AC Milan, C, Bayern Munich, or D, Liverpool Football Club? Mate, if you miss this, your shooting accuracy is worse than Forrest this season. It's between Liverpool and AC Milan. You lot know it's between Liverpool and AC Milan. I know my football. I have I know nothing AC to say. Up I have nothing to say. I have <laughs> nothing to say. <laughs> Uh, but considering Liverpool have won the Champions League recently, I am going to go for Liverpool. Well, a chance oh, again. No, it was from oh. Nicolas Pepe this time. Oh, wait, and it will go off. off the post. Off the post, but it goes oh. like central to Aubameyang. Can Aubameyang finish? So it was the wrong answer. However, oh. um, you will have another opportunity as Aubameyang oh. recovers, sees that it went off the post, and Aubameyang will have a tap in. Oh my However, gosh. you have to answer the question correctly. Yeah, go on. If you missed what, or if you're just tuning in to what has happened, the third chance for Arsenal, it's from Nicola Pepe, who has hit the, hit the bar. However, we will have another chance for Aubameyang to put the rebound in. However... The question needs to be answered correctly. What country won the under-20 FIFA World Cup in 2015? Your three options are... Oh, you're kidding me. A, yeah. Croatia, B, Serbia, or C, England? England. Is that your final answer? <laughs> England. It has to be in England. Sorry, mate. Oh, wait, I am. <laughs> Is that your final answer? Wait, 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 wait. 2015. Because. Oh, God, this is dangerous. This, this could be a trick one. I'm being nice to you, mate. That's huh? for sure, right? Wait, wait. Let me think. Let me think. Because I can't get this wrong. Let me think. Let me actually think. Um. 2015. What year was that? Wait, wait, I'm trying to deep it. No, it's not England. Under 20. Yeah, it's not England. It's not England because England won it, I think, 2017. Yeah, it's not England. It's either Serbia or Croatia. But my, my instinct is telling me Serbia. Let me go for Serbia. Serbia is Ty's final answer. And with that, he has scored the opening goal as a Pierre-Emerick Aubameyang with his left foot finishes in the near corner and makes two with the fourth opportunity, golden opportunity of the game in London. I knew it. What was my instinct? So, I guess a good question, you know, how, how have things been this season at Plymouth? You know, you're getting uh, regular first-team football now. Um, yeah. And how are you enjoying it? Uh, I'm enjoying it a lot, Morgan. You know, it, um, it's been everything that I've dreamed of. You know, since I've got here, I felt like it would take me a bit longer to get into a team or such because obviously the manager's brought me here to play. But it's like obviously he's got his own players, and if they're playing well, in particular at the time that I've got here, then it's hard for me to kind of like just come into the team you don't just walk into the team you have to wait for the right opportunity and yeah. when things are not going so well then your your you know your place is kind of staked up for stakes do you know what I mean like no one's place is guaranteed especially if we're losing games or not playing well no one's place you know is guaranteed and yeah. I was just kind of waiting for that opportunity but something happened I think um so obviously I was on the bench against Hull and then I had the Cheltenham match in the cup and I showcased what I could do. Everyone was talking about me after the match. Everyone was saying that, look, this boy I can't really, really play. So I was like, oh, cool. Do you know what I mean? Like, yeah. maybe be on the bench if I get half an hour, 45 minutes to showcase what I can do. I just need yep. to take the opportunity and, and play well. But for some reason, um, a day before the match, we are training. One of the players that was meant to start, he had an ankle injury or, or like a sprain. And I remember... Um, I think yeah, the gaffer he pulled me off the train and just said like I'll be ready to to start because obviously the player like he's got a sprain and that and um, 
you are meant to get 45, but it looks like you'll be starting. I was ready. I knew that if I come to the team, there's no way I'm going to allow someone to take my shirt. And um, no disrespect to anyone, but I believe that there isn't a player like me that plays in this team. I know that for sure. This is why they've done so much to get me here. And I'm proving that yeah. now. I feel like with the performances, you know, that you know I've done and made, you know, I feel like I'm showing everyone, even Forrest, what I can do on a regular basis, playing 90 minutes and having the trust of the coaching staff and the club here. That uh, yeah, like this boy going to do big things, and I'm just trying to show that. So yeah, you see the, the opportunity, mate. Yeah, yeah, I've got the opportunity against um, I think was it Burton? Yeah, Burton in the league, and I played really well. And uh, the manager's really pleasing me. Then since then, I've just kept my shirt. And I've played well, and I've got better and better with every game. I think to show the manager and everyone what you know why they rate me so highly and for us as well. Yeah. So. I'm just taking every game as it comes and just thriving off the pressure that, you know, I okay. don't really feel, but I'm just thriving off it. Yo, man, take in. After every match, they get a Domino's each. Wait, what? That, how match. does that work? So, like, you come back on the bus and, like, whether we're home or away, you will see pizza. Like, well, especially when we're home, we see pizza, like, so in the change rooms, you've got, like, a little, like, table. So you've got, like, the fridge at the bottom, but there's a table at the top. And it's kind of like, it's where the pizza's all stacked and then like, obviously the chicken, the chips and stuff. So after the game, so we get dang. like a Domino's and yeah, everyone's buzzing. Because after the game, like they get food and like, but yeah. they won't be buzzing if we lose, but it's like, it's a good feeling. Yeah, you come the back pizza and, like, shits you up. Yeah. Mate, the pizza always works. It's like a secret trick because either you lose and it's like, yeah, oh shit, pizza. Or you like, yeah. you win and you're like, let's celebrate. Let's, pe let's eat pizza. So, so we're but away journeys is, is better to have a Domino's on away journeys because you can kind of like sit Especially in the past your own corner. Yeah, it's, it's the best feeling. Like, you can't describe it. Everywhere's it's, a trip from Plymouth. But everywhere is, yeah, mileage from like Plymouth. Plymouth is like yeah. the bottom of earth, basically. Before before we let you go, Tyrese, I do have to get your... We'll give, we'll give you the 1-0 win there in the no-name football <laughs> game. Um... <laughs> So it's okay, but we're gonna we're gonna be doing a league uh, table. We're gonna be doing mm. a league table in terms of how everyone does in the, the game done by goal defense. So mm. you're currently sitting at the top of the table with one, and I'm there with a minus one. It's not a great start. Long may it continue. But lack of opportunities, but you you I mean you cut out the play pretty nicely every time I try to push forward. To be honest, I so, think I think uh, Leeds did not have chances in this game. If if I'm to be honest, they never got into their fight, their attacking <laughs> third. So I think uh, Arsenal definitely deserved to win this game. But uh, they had chances; they could have won four nothing. But uh, one nothing is the way it goes. Great result. Anyway, oh, well, so Tyrese, Leeds lose. Last thing I oh, want to just get your thoughts on. So, mm. you touched on it a bit earlier. So, Chris Hewton, who yeah. was at Brighton, um, as, you know, things kind of went south there, and you didn't really feel like you had a connection with him. You weren't really... Didn't feel like he valued you, which you feel like you're getting more, more so for us, especially at Plymouth at the moment. So, obviously, with Chris Hewton coming into the Forest setup now... Um, and obviously, you guys have that bit of history. Where where do you see your future kind of going? Because obviously, um, you're going to be at Plymouth. Um, then you go back to Forest. You're going to be a bit hotter on the market. You know the way you're playing at Plymouth. One would think. Um, so, what do you what do you kind of see in your near future? Be on this loan spell. My my ambition is always to 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 be a Forest player. First and foremost, my ambition is to go back to Forest and hopefully play every week at the city ground or away from home and represent um, the Jabardi. You know, that's 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 my ambition to represent. You know, the, the, you know the Reds as as you call it, and you know play every week consistently for them. That's my ambition. But you know, with football, sometimes your ambition never goes to plan. So. For me, I've, I've always been open-minded, but for me, first and foremost, I'm at a club where they've always pushed their own to kind of be one of the mainstays in the team. You look at the recent years, you know, Ben Berrett and Matty Cash, um, Jermaine Genius, 
so many names I can name that have gone on, you know, from the academy and gone on to be a mainstay in, in in the first team. For Forest, I've uh, got moves. You know, if they do well, they want a move, and you know, things work out that way. So that's yeah. my ambition to just go back to Forest and then um, basically knuckle down there and and play. I look like, forward to like going back and obviously showcasing myself at Forest, and you know, looking forward to meeting Christian. You know. Paul Trollope and the coaching staff and just knuckling down. And Ty, closing statement. So yeah. we've talked a lot about kind of your journey mm. and you've you faced your fair share, fair share of rejection, you know, um, times when you thought that it was going well and it hasn't worked out, um, times where teams have just told you, you know, you're not good enough, uh, time mm. and time again. So if you had to give a message to, to people watching, Either, you know, specifically people that want to grow up in the, you know, football and do well in football or in whatever they're doing in life. And they're also going to face rejection as me and Jovan both mm. have ourselves. What message could you give to them through your experiences? Um, don't, allow, um, don't allow a man to dictate your path and your future. What I mean by that is more spiritual for me because I'm obviously a Christian and I see things on on that scale don't allow man to dictate your fate and your future always believe in god always believe in yourself in your abilities and and the talent that god is giving you to kind of push you to you know and to and to be confident in yourself as well to know that you know if you go somewhere and, and you know it doesn't work out to know that okay i'm good but you know i might not be the right fit for this particular club or this particular thing at that moment in time do you know what I mean I feel I feel like in life people allow things to knock them down and they say to themselves oh I'm no good it's not always the case I think there's always good in people even if there's there's negative and people see negatives in people there's always good in someone you know it's just about being kind of like um, fine-tuned you know like a rough diamond you know when you polish it it becomes good do you know what I mean so I feel like Everyone's got this diamond in them, but it's about it being polished and um, someone actually taking time and and understanding the person, not just the player or, you know, or that, you know, human being, actually understanding them and, you know, their dynamics that makes them the way they are and, you know, taking time with them. So I feel like, yeah, I'm going to go with just being confident, believing in yourself, believing in God, trusting the process and not allowing things to bog you down and, always getting up every morning or every afternoon or every evening for training and, and saying that I want to be the best player and show people why they should take me on. A story of faith, potential and resilience. Tyrese Fauna, Nottingham Forest player, currently playing at Plymouth Argyle. Big thanks, mate. Uh, all seriousness, had a great conversation. Um, yeah, so I enjoyed it on my side. I'm happy that you got the 1-0 win for Gunners. Uh, Gunners and Morgan, um, yeah, just speaking on behalf of both of us, we really appreciate you coming on and hopefully we'll be in touch again. Anytime, boys. Thank you for having me. Thank yeah. you. Yeah, pleasure, great. pleasure. Thank so, Thank you so much. This has been TFF Plus One with Tyrese Fauna. Thank you very much and Thank take care, guys. everyone. Have a good night. Take care.